This video is sponsored by PV Case. More on them later. I've always thought it would be cool to have a boat with unlimited range that could just go all day every day without ever needing to refuel. Imagine the places you could go. Of course, a sailboat can do this, but then you're at mercy of the wind. Last year, I bought this crappy old 13-foot Boston whaler and completely restored it. My plan was to use two electric e-foil motors for propulsion and add solar panels to turn it into my unlimited range dream boat. This video is about the solar panel part. I've already made videos about the hull restoration and propulsion system, so if you want to go watch those, they can be found on my channel. As for the solar panels, I chose to mount them on either sides of the boat because it will be relatively easy to do and to make transportation simple, since the panels will just be able to fold in on top of themselves during trailering. Building a roof with the solar panels mounted on that would have been better, but also way more work. This version is just kind of a proof of concept to see if long range solar boating is actually an idea worth pursuing further. So let's start with the build. Step one was to design the solar panel pivot mounts in Onshape. Onshape is a cloud native CAD program which makes sharing files and collaborating with others super easy. So if anyone out there has an old Boston whaler and wants to mount big pivoting things on the sides, just click on the link in the description and you'll have access to all these designs. You can even go in and change all the core dimensions to make it suit your needs. After I had those drawn up, I 3D printed them to do a quick fit check. After confirming the dimensions would work, I sent the files off to PCBWay for manufacturing. PCBWay offers CNC machining services with no minimum order quantity, so you can have one-off parts made for personal projects or whatever you want. A few weeks later, the designs showed up in the mail, CNC machined out of quarter-inch aluminum plate. Wow, wee, look at that. They looked great and fit together perfectly. Now time for the solar panels. I'm using six of these 175 watt flexible panels from Renogy. The best part about these is that they're relatively lightweight compared to rigid panels. My plan was to use L-shaped aluminum extrusion to make the frame around the panels that hold them all together. This was relatively straightforward to build. It just required a lot of drilling, sawing, and eventually I ended up with one big floppy solar panel. At first I was not stoked on the floppiness, but it actually turned out to be super important, as you'll see later. I drilled some holes in the sides and mounted the big aluminum pivot plates on there. Then I mounted the other side of the pivot plates onto the wood benches of my boat. This way I wouldn't need to drill any holes in the hull to mount the panels. The benches just sit in the boat as usual, and the panels bolt onto the outsides. For the center pivot part I'm using a 3 8 inch shoulder bolt and a lock nut on the other side. All the holes in the outer diameter of the plates are spaced out so that I have a lot of mounting angle options for the panels when they are both folded out over the water and folded in for trailering. The angle is locked in place with two pins on each side. The issue with just having one panel installed is that it's too heavy for the benches so they just tilt up off of the boat, so I had to get the other one installed on there to act as a counterweight. After that I was able to lift the panels up for the first time and test out the support system. It actually seemed to work pretty well, until this happened. Well, I just tried to fold them up and the weight of the top panel rested on the bottom panel and this aluminum just kinked. So that goes to show that these pieces are not strong enough. <laughs> Need to rethink that one. After that happened, I bolted on some 8th inch aluminum strips over the weak parts to add strength so they wouldn't fold again. That seemed to work out pretty well. Next it was time to get the solar panels all wired up to the MPPT controller. I'm using the Renogy Rover 60 amp charge controller. Its job is to pull just the right amount of power out of the solar panels so that they can operate at their maximum efficiency point. Once that was wired up, it was time to take the boat out on the lake for its initial solar test. And unfortunately, it was cloudy, but at least we'll be able to find out how much power they can make when it's overcast. Before launching the boat, I tilted the panels up at a 90 degree angle so that I could load the boat full of all the supplies and then back it into the water. This is my very temporary fender solution. <laughs> I CNC cut them at like 10 p.m. last night. Today we are joined by Zuzu the dog and Ansel the boy. First impressions with the solar panels was that visibility is terrible. You can't see anything. But that's okay because the panels only need to be up for a short amount of time after launching and before pulling the boat out of the water. At first I didn't have the right technique going on and I tried to lower the panels with strings. This was nearly impossible to do because of their weight and awkward angle. I later learned that the move is to incrementally pivot the panels one hole at a time taking advantage of the fact that they can skew a lot. We looked it up, the operating cost is estimated at 15 million a year. So we're getting 182 watts of power with this panel up and this panel down and no sun. So that's pretty good. Oh, baby! <laughs> oh, that one's touching. Is it? <laughs> yeah. Oh. <laughs> Once the panels were down, they did seem plenty strong. The aluminum didn't bend when one corner dipped down into the water and impacts from waves didn't seem to have a big effect. This boat is apparently owned by one of the guys behind Blackberry. I guess they made a lot of money licensing their tech out to other companies, even though their phones didn't end up doing all that well. 
That's a cold dog, not a hot dog. She's about to be hot. <laughs> She's warming me up. <laughs> yeah. We are towing a train of kayakers here. Choo choo. It's still pretty cloudy and the boat is doing 1100 watts and the solar is doing 620 watts. It's pretty good for, for no sun and for having strings on our solar panels. How do you feel about this? Zuzu's just like, I want some cheese. <laughs> I want cheese. fiber road bike on the Coast Guard ship. It's a herd of gooses. Wow. Sebastian, touch one. <laughs> oh no, we got a straggler. Go little guy, go. <laughs> so the sun came out just in time for lunch. We put one of the solar panels up for docking and ate on the boat. After that, we cruised around the lake with quite a few people in the boat, and the solar panels were able to supply plenty of power to maintain a speed at a little over three knots without having to draw any power from the batteries. That's all I had ever hoped for for this project, so I would say it's a big success. Definitely not the right hull type for low speed driving like this, but oh well, still a successful proof of concept. What I really need is one of those coaching launches. They would make for amazing solar boats. You'll notice that with this configuration, the solar panels are partially shaded by some of the passengers, but this doesn't really matter when we're just leisurely cruising around the lake. They still make plenty of power. But when I'm on the boat alone going for maximum distance, I can just move around to avoid shading the panels. I know, I know, a solar roof would probably be better, but like I said before, that'll probably come if there's ever a solar boat V2. So I've been driving around all day. The MPPT says we're still doing 450 watts and the battery is 100% full even though the sun is at a pretty low angle in the sky now. Earlier today I was doing 1100 watts. That's the highest power that I observed on the MPPT. Haphazardly mounting solar panels to your boat is pretty easy, but building large solar arrays on land or rooftops can get pretty challenging due to shading from trees, solar panels, topography, or other things. To help with that challenge, there's PV Case. PV Case is a next-generation AutoCAD-based PV software that allows users to simulate the physical locations of a solar plant, incorporating 3D topographical data of the surroundings. PV Case is the ideal choice for companies undertaking large commercial and industrial projects, as well as utility-scale plants. The software's intuitive workflows and streamlined processes help reduce the learning curve and improve productivity. By offering features for prototyping, electrical design, stringing, shading analysis, train analysis, and automatic generation of construction documentation, PV Case enables engineers and designers to take a project from its initial stages all the way to the procurement phase. This end-to-end -end approach can help streamline workflows, reduce errors, and save time by eliminating the need to switch between different tools or software platforms. Their ground mount solar plant feature offers flexible 3D modeling in complex terrain resulting in shade-free table placement. It also has piling and collision analysis for motion-controlled panels and automated 3D cable routing that even accounts for topographical variants. Their roof mount solar array feature offers rapid 3D building preparation, shading calculation, and semi-automated electrical design features, all making it much easier to plan and procure solar power systems. Click on the link in the description to learn more about this awesome new software. Now back to the video. If you've watched the previous videos about this boat project, you've probably heard me complaining about how the props are vibrating while underwater even though they are perfectly balanced and run smooth in the air. This was around the time I began to think the vibrations weren't from in balance, but instead from the prop blades chopping through the wake created by the vertical mast portion of the outboards that is made out of 2x4s. And since only one side of the blade is passing through the wake at a time, it would lead to an imbalance of thrust and an imbalance of force on the motor shaft, which would cause vibration. This is more likely to be a problem with my design than it is with other outboard motors because my 2x4 masts are really much wider than they need to be. Still a proper foil shape, but way too thick. Definitely something I would change if I were redesigning these outboards. 
I figured that maybe if I extend the masts downward past the motor, then both blades of the propeller would be chopping through the wake at the same time, and that would hopefully balance out the forces on the shaft and reduce vibration. So I 3D printed these mast extenders on my Form 3 Plus. I'm using their clear resin for this because it's just what I had laying around, but it ended up being pretty cool because we can actually see the internal support structure inside, since I made them hollow to save resin. So those just screw right onto the back side of the motor mount and effectively extend the mast downward. With that, it was back out on the water. This is hilarious. There's a vine growing through the parking machine. We're about to launch the boat here in West Seattle, and we've got version two of these new fenders that work with the solar panel attachments. So this is the packaging material from this new battery I got over here. It's getting windy. It was so calm when we got here. Oh, Jesus. Wow, this dock moves a lot. Collision inbound. That's a high-speed water taxi. Wow, that was a hectic launch. <laughs> well, we already blew so far. Anyways, there's a lot of waves. This thing is zooming along, just throttled down. These boats, these high-speed ferries make pretty big wakes. Got a bigger ferry over there, going to Seattle, probably from Bainbridge. So we're gonna go where it's less windy, down the Duwamish River. The wind chop is only gonna get worse. When, I swear, when we pulled in here in the car, it was like glass, remember? I said, it's like a lake out there today. And now suddenly it's like the ocean. It's because it is the ocean. So this was the first time launching my boat in salt water. We launched it in Elliott Bay, which is part of the Puget Sound, which eventually connects to the ocean. At first, I didn't ever want to use these submerged motors in salt water, but eventually I figured out, oh, what the heck. They're full of mineral oil, so they should be fine. There's a really big old dock right here. Looks like it's slowly falling apart. And then there's this crazy big house barge looking thing with a helipad right there. Whoa! <laughs> I don't know how we're gonna pull the boat out of the water this afternoon. There's some big container ships over here in dock getting loaded up with containers. There's a ferry in dry dock right there. We have the solar panels tilted up at a bit of an angle to avoid the waves. Now we're surfing. We're riding the waves. We're cruising. Woo! Let's see, we're pulling 3,000 watts. Oh yeah, we don't wanna hit this boat. Oh, it's so windy. These panels might fold if they get hit by a big enough gust. Oh, here comes the container. It's getting loaded up. Look at that bulbous bow. There's a seagull sitting on the bulb. Wow, -wee, that's a big crane. The wind waves only got worse, and we were getting concerned that we wouldn't be able to make it back to the boat ramp. So we decided to turn back into the wind and see how the boat handled going into the swell. Okay, Sebastian, get ready to take some waves over the bow. <laughs> I think we're good. Okay, all right, let's turn around. Here comes the big one. Oh yeah. Woo! Oh shit, you know what I forgot? What? Is the, the bailing device. <laughs> this tugboat's doing something. Oh, maybe they're pulling out that old piece of wood. That old piling. That's a nice looking tugboat. One of our missions for the day was to do some submarine exploring with the Feefish underwater drone. This was also my first time using it in salt water, so I was excited to see how the scenery differed from freshwater lakes. We launched the submarine on the side of the shipping canal, and I forgot to turn on the microphone to record our voices, but we did end up finding some interesting stuff, like old pier pilings that must have been cut off underwater, plenty of starfish, a bunch of wood that was probably from a shipwreck or an old pier that collapsed. I found our anchor hooked on a piece of wood, a spiky sea slug, some crazy looking sea anemone type creatures that seemed to glow in the submarine's light, and then I got the submarine's tether caught around a big log. Luckily, I was able to follow it back around, and we just pulled on it, and the rest came free. Crisis averted. I want a tugboat. Those are so cool. I really want to know who lives in that thing. I want to live there. That thing is awesome. Although, this is a super fun site, so maybe it wouldn't be too great to live here. We might have a potential collision coming up. What is that? I can't tell. Oh, it's a crane barge. We're going under the West Seattle Bridge here. This is an old drawbridge for trains up ahead. Yeah, that's a big concrete counterweight right there to offset the weight of the bridge when it goes down. That's interesting. It's so steampunk. And here we have a tugboat coming up. That's pretty neat. So at this point, we were just cruising up the Duwamish waterway, looking for more interesting places to explore with the submarine. There's a pile of shredded cars and stuff. They've got this giant winch right there, and it looks like they're trying to pull that crane forward or something. Doesn't make any sense. I don't know what they're doing. We're getting chased down by two tugboats. Look at this. People have hung little swallow nests or something from these posts. They have little holes on them for birds to go in there. We got another herd of gooses soaking up the oil in the Superfund site. Looks like another cement factory here. 
They're probably gonna pull that barge up to Alaska. Wow. Wow, that one's doing two at once. Looks like this is a ferry loading ramp. The Polar Endurance. Those are some old looking tugboats. Looks like some sort of a big old vacuum on the top of that with a sucker. That's like a concrete vacuum or something. Maybe it's for grain or something and they pump grain through that tube, yeah. The Pacific Trader. That's a big barge, holy shit, look at the size of that barge. That's the biggest barge I've ever seen. We're in some wind swell now, we're surfing again. These are big waves. The boat ramp that we had put in at had gotten way too wavy to take the boat out, so we went to check out this alternative boat ramp that was a little over three miles up the river. It doesn't look like anyone's used it anytime recently. It was looking pretty sketchy though, because not only was it steep, but it was also covered in algae, which would make it slippery. Or at least it was during low tide. Dude, but what if my truck slides into the water? What if it's slippery? Well, that's what I'm saying. If, if it's water level going to be higher later on? There's a boat ramp, but no dock. This dock says private, no public moorage or docking. That's weird. We decided that it would be fine to pull the boat out there, but we would need to wait until high tide, which was around 6 p.m. There's loaders driving around up there, scooping gravel off of this one. Holy cow, look at that. That's where we're going. Way down the river. What a view. So majestic. Yeah, so this must be the cement factory over here. Those are some big cranes. Here is a river boat next to a barge full of timber. Must be the Timber Baron's yacht. I wonder if that thing actually powers it. It's not even touching the water at the moment. So the motor's off right now and we're still drifting into the wind. And that's because we're in a river that's connected to the ocean and the tide is coming out right now and the river's coming out. We decided to go take one more look at Elliott Bay and the odd chance that the wind had died and the water had calmed down, but it was still pretty bad. We got water in the boat now. We've been taking some waves over the bow. We came back out to the ocean to see if this boat can handle the waves and uh, it sort of can, but <laughs> there's a few big ones that have gone over. So we have decided that uh, taking the boat out at the boat ramp is not gonna be possible. I mean, it probably would be possible. We would probably de destroy the boat while we're doing it. So now we're gonna go back to the, oh geez. So now we're gonna go back to the river and take refuge. We just dropped anchor here right in front of this no loitering sign and then we're gonna do some submarine exploring it's nice and calm right here because this building's blocking the wind all right put that sucker in there it goes got some kelp down there some spiny things grassy things look at that that's weird oh more starfish these ones are white nice. were the last ones white we i thought so yeah oh i found our anchor ha! look at that it's right by a starfish oh what's it stuck on just dirt. Oh. It's a good thing it didn't drag too much further. It would have hit the starfish. Yep. Yeah, look at this. There's the pier piling. Is that a crab? Look at the crab. Is it a crab? No, yeah, right there. Kelp. See it? No, no, no. Oh, oh that one, that one, that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a crab. It's a real life crab. Oh, yeah. Look at him. He's shy. I'm going to blind him. There must be all sorts of interesting stuff in these pier pilings. Oh, look at that. Big fish. Wow. Sweet. Oh, here's some more of those things and enemy things they're growing on a rope hi little guy you want to fight me you can see the current flowing now i'm getting blown with the current actually going pretty quick oh, oh, oh sea line right there or a seal i don't know the difference right in the middle oh it? yeah seal wow it's real shallow in here is this less than three now it's only three feet deep right here oh, 2.8 feet according to the fish finder not a lot of room oh, those logs are just sitting on the ground we're gonna go tie up over there in the wind sheltered area and have lunch. So it's low tide right now. When the tide comes up, a lot of this island goes underwater, or at least all this stuff right here. I wonder if anyone lives in there. Crusty looking barges. There's a bunch of random dudes hanging out in the bushes up here. Perfect place for lunch. <laughs> what you got there, Sebastian? Got a salad on top, some noodle thing on the bottom. Very nice. Gonna be good. Wowie. That's one big mountain. Look how good that thing looks. It's hilarious. It's like a little satellite. So I just got off here to check out this alternative boat ramp that's going to have less waves. But either way, we'll have to pull the boat out of the water at like 6 p.m. or later. Yeah, it's got to be some sort of a aquatic plant restoration thing. That's just a big pile of smashed cars. Oh, I just threw a chunk. Just think, Sebastian, in 80 years, that's gonna be your car. This must be someone's house right there, right next to the Superfund site. 
This is called a sediment cap. I think they put all this sediment over all the toxic materials that were left here. It says do not disturb the sediment because then you'll stir up the toxic muck. This is a big ass building. Look at that, it's a barge on a barge. Two barges on a barge. There's a whole harbor up here, wow. See how the fins have some tilt to them like that? They do a little turn. Look at that, it's the track straight when one end swings out. Long Beach, Dutch Harbor. Well, that thing's from Dutch Harbor. That's a long ways away. We just tasted the water and it's fresh here. So I think we've come far enough up the Duwamish as to where we're out of the salt water. I think we were also past the industrial stuff along the shoreline. So there's no more barges or anything like that. I guess looks like there used to be at one point. There's some remnants here, but mostly it's just turned into a river. We're gonna do the submarine underneath this bridge and look for dead bodies and guns. Oh my God, it already blew away. It might be very difficult to go here. There's also terrible visibility here. I don't know if we're gonna see anything. Oh, there's the bottom, wow. Oh, it's actually sandy. Oh, I think I just saw a dead fish float by. It's crazy, I feel like I'm in a dust storm. Oh, that's good, I got a freshwater rinse. We've exited the nasty part of the river. It's much cleaner and more tranquil over here. So the herd of gooses in their natural habitat. Just by angling this panel up, we got 200 extra watts. Now with both of these panels, we're doing 900 watts. Seattle is about eight miles off in the distance and we're battling the wind and the current. So it's times like these when I'm glad that we have way too much solar surface area. Good luck. See you later. Sebastian just dropped me off about three miles away from the boat ramp that we put in at and I'm gonna run back there um, to go get the truck. <laughs> so at this point I ran like three miles back to get the trailer and Sebastian drove the boat back up the river two miles to meet me at the sketchy boat ramp. There's Sebastian, I can see him right there. It says cement down there so uh, maybe they're going to that place right there or maybe the one behind it or is it that one? Yeah, it's probably this one. That looks like cement to me. Looks like the bridges just went up. Wonder who's coming through. That thing's pretty big looking, making a pretty wide turn. All right, made it. Took about 40 minutes. Daniel said he got to his car eight minutes ago, so he uh, should be moving soon. Like eight wrong turns later, there he is. There he is. Okay, Sebastian, bring her in easy. All right, here it is, we got it. As for the mast extensions that I added onto the motors earlier on, they didn't really seem to work at all. The vibration was pretty much unchanged with both two, three, and six bladed propellers. This footage is from my toroidal prop testing video where I was blowing bubbles down into the water to visualize the flow. Later on, I did pretty much solve this vibration problem, and it wasn't by making the mast turbulence evenly distributed over the prop, but instead just by reducing the mast turbulence as much as possible. I'll talk more about that in a future video. That's it for now. Thanks for watching. Bye.